And please introduce our speakers. Well, I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce these two individuals. Um, I'm first going to introduce Carl Parrish. He's the founder and leader of the Phoenix Represent Arizona chapter. He helped to campaign for Proposition 403 in Temp Tempe that 91% of voters approved. He also campaigned for Proposition 419 in Phoenix that passed with 85% voter approval. Carl is a senior software engineer for a local startup that utilizes artificial intelligence to diagnose medical illnesses, which will hopefully reduce medical expenses for thousands of people. Carl has held board positions for Arizona Sustainable Alliance and the Maricopa Green Town, uh, Party. Sorry, <laughs> um, Terry. I um, think everybody knows him, but during eight years as Attorney General, 2003 to 2011, he focused on protecting consumers and fighting transnational organized crime. In 2010, he received the Kelly Wyman Award, which is the highest recognition given by his fellow state attorneys general. As mayor of Phoenix from 1984 to 1990, Terry increased citizen participation in government and led nationally recognized efforts in law enforcement, economic development, long-range city planning, and the arts. Terry practices law and teaches at the ASU College of Law. He served on active duty in the Navy and retired as a commander after 27 years in the Naval Reserve. An Arizona native, he is a graduate of Harvard College and the ASU College of Law. Terry lives in downtown Phoenix with his wife, Monica, and their ASU student son. So. With that, please help me welcome both Carl and Terry. Thank you very much for having us here. Um, this is my first time coming. It will not be my last. This is a very warm, very energetic crowd. I really appreciate that. Um, I want to point out, my name is Carl Parrish. I'm the founder of um, Represent Us, the uh, Arizona chapter of Represent Us. Represent Us is a nationwide uh, grassroots organization. We're nonpartisan, uh, set up to fight uh, government corruption. And so you can find out more about the national chapter at represent.us. I'm going to show a video, give some more information about that. Uh, as the founder and as somebody who goes around speaking a lot, a lot of times people associate represent us with me. I want to make sure that I, uh, there's quite a few of us out here in the audience today, and I want to make sure I give a shout out to the 16,000 um, members in Arizona who have uh, sure who have volunteered or um, have uh, donated uh, over the past three years I really want to um, make sure that they're acknowledged now let's see we're gonna start off with our little introductory video if I can get there from here okay. how do I you show me the quick trick and I don't remember <laughs> Ah, thank you. Okay, so we're going to do a quick introduction with uh, one of our spokespeople, Jennifer Lawrence. And let's see. We are witnessing a total political system failure in America. If you're anything like me, you may find yourself constantly overwhelmed by everything that's wrong with politics. And when I say politics, I'm not talking about Democrats or Republicans. I'm talking about the flaws that exist in our political system, regardless of which party is in power. And I know it's hard to talk about politics these days, but look, the government is ours. We pay for it, so it needs to work for us. And right now it doesn't, and I mean it really doesn't. So what's going on here? Is it Russian meddling and social media? Is it him? Is it her? No. 
Those two were the least popular presidential candidates since they began keeping track of such things. Only 4% of Americans have a great deal of confidence in Congress now. Just 4%. America is no longer even considered a full democracy. We are witnessing a total political system failure in America, which is the complete opposite of what our nation's founders had in mind. So I'm gonna show you three lines that show what's causing this failure, how we can fix it, and what you can do about it. So here's your first line. What I want you to do is take any issue you really care about and picture it on this line. This line comes from a Princeton University study that shows how public opinion influences the laws that Congress does or doesn't pass. They looked at 1,800 public opinion polls over a 20-year period, and we took their data and plotted it in this chart. See this horizontal line? That shows public support for a law amongst average Americans. This vertical line? That shows the likelihood of the public support leading to the passage of a law. When you plot it for the average American, you get a line that looks like this. There's your issue sitting on that line. If there is zero support for a law, there's about a 30% chance that Congress is going to pass it. And if there is 100% support for something, the most popular thing ever, there's still a 30% chance that Congress is gonna pass it. So the line is horizontal, because no matter how much support there is among average Americans, there's still a 30% chance that Congress is gonna pass that law. Princeton determined that the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy. How in the hell does that happen? Consider this. Politicians are spending up to 70% of their time raising funds for re-election after they get into office. Why? Because in order to win a seat in the Senate in some races, you would have to raise $45,000 every single day. 365 days a year for six years to raise enough money to win. Now consider that only 0.05% of Americans give more than $10,000 to politics. And then you see why politicians have become completely dependent on the 0.05% of Americans, billionaires and special interest groups, who fund their campaigns. Meanwhile, you've got lobbyists writing our laws and donating to the politicians who pass them. We have a two-party duopoly of Democrats and Republicans that makes it so that independents can't win, while the American people are leaving the major parties in droves. As you can see here, nearly half of American voters are now registered independent. And then there's gerrymandering, with politicians drawing the boundaries of their own voting districts into crazy shapes designed to prevent competition. Today, only 14% of House campaigns are actually competitive. 86% of them are not. And we wonder why young people feel that their vote doesn't matter. I've covered a lot here, but it all adds up to this vast ring of influence over our elected leaders. It's a corrupt system in which we, the people, have near zero influence over our own government. And that is sad. That is not the country I feel like I grew up in. But what's worse is that by allowing this to happen, we are causing the failure of the most important issues facing our nation. We're wasting trillions of dollars a year on fraud and abuse in our own government. One in five American children live in poverty. Our health care is the most expensive in the world. We have more people in prison per capita than Russia and China. We're losing jobs to the rest of the world. And we're not even doing enough to keep our air and our water clean for our children. America was founded on the promise of self-governance. But instead, we have statistically non-significant impact on public policy. So the question is, how do we unrig this system? I'm obsessed with this idea, not just of unrigging it, but actually fixing it. That's when I met Josh. This is it. This is the issue behind the issues. If we fix the system, we'll have so much more power to fix everything else. So I spoke to some of the most brilliant people in the country constitutional scholar Lawrence Lessig, Zephyr Teachout, and dozens of other constitutional scholars and experts and strategists. They all said the same thing. You could pass a law that would stop political bribery and fix our broken elections, and if you could do that, you could wrest power away from the corrupt establishment and put it back in the hands of the people. Here's how you fix our broken elections. 
and gerrymandering with independent redistricting commissions. Create ranked choice voting so third parties and independents can run and win. Implement automatic voter registration and vote from home. And here's how we can crack down on political bribery. Overhaul lobbying and ethics laws and close the revolving door so politicians can't be bribed with high-paying job offers. Mandate full transparency of political spending so we know who's trying to buy influence. Give every voter a $50 or $100 tax voucher so politicians spend time fundraising from their constituents, not just that 0.05% that I talked about earlier. If you could pass even just some of these reforms, you would undo that ring of influence and begin to reinstate we the people as the most important influence over our elected leaders. So we took all of these reforms and put them in a model law and named it the Anti-Corruption Act. And get this, 87% of Americans support making the Anti-Corruption Act the law of the land. Look at the breakdown, 91% of Democrats and 83% of Republicans. It's incredible. Now you might be thinking nine out of 10 Americans, surely Congress will pass it. But on this issue, more than any other issue, it's like asking the fox to put a lock on the hen house. Politicians won in the current system, and they have an incentive not to fix it. So we need to go around Congress, in this case, by passing anti-corruption acts in cities and states all across America. Now, every time I say this, people look at me and say, how does passing city and state laws lead to fixing all of these problems with the federal government? Can I do this part? Go for it. So first of all, the U.S. Constitution gives states sole control over how elections are run, even federal elections. So when we fix gerrymandering or election laws, that fixes a federal election in each state. That means that by going state by state, we have an immediate impact on how we elect Congress and how we hold them accountable. But there's more, and that brings us to our second line. This line is from a Bloomberg News study. It finds that throughout American history, passing state laws leads to federal victory. Let me show you what I mean. This chart shows the number of states over time that pass laws giving women the right to vote. When it hits the right side of the chart, that's the federal victory. Okay, now I want you to watch the blue line. We're gonna do this again with interracial marriage. There were a few states in the Northeast that made it legal decades ago, and centuries go by, and we hit this blue line where all of a sudden there's a rush of activity which leads pretty quickly to federal passage. So here we are again with same-sex marriage. One state, Massachusetts, for many years. A couple decades later, we hit that blue line, a jump in state activity and federal passage. This isn't about these issues. This is about a winning political strategy. The crucial finding in the Bloomberg study is that a key event, often a court decision or a grassroots campaign reaching maturity, triggers a rush of state activity that ultimately leads to a change in federal law. So fixing this problem is possible, but how do we create our trigger moment for this issue? Well, the grassroots campaign from the study, that's represent us. We're bringing conservatives and progressives together to pass anti-corruption laws all across America using three strategic innovations, right-left coalitions, calling out corruption, and building a movement, a big movement. And I'm gonna break them down for you. Can I do this part? No. First, right, left. This is how people self-identify in America. This isn't party identification. This is how you feel politically. And as you can see, it's 25% liberal, 36% conservative, and 34% moderate. But for the past 40 years on the reforms I've outlined, it's liberals speaking to liberals using liberal language with liberal messengers, liberal. I just had to say that one more time. And you're just not gonna change the political power structure of America with 25% of the people. Fixing corruption requires that we enlist all Americans, liberal, conservatives, and moderates, who, as we've shown, overwhelmingly support reform. Number two, corruption. When we talk about money and politics, gerrymandering, democracy, campaign finance reform, most people just tune out. But people are fired up about corruption. And number three, we must build a movement, a big movement comprised of all kinds of people from all across America fighting to pass anti-corruption laws, and then make sure they are implemented and protected. So again, liberals and conservatives working together, corruption, and build a movement. This is the foundation of Represent Us. We believe the government should work for every American, not just a handful of billionaires and special interests, but it's not just an idea. 
In a few years, we've already racked up 85 wins all across the country. And if we can get those 85 wins to 850 wins, we can fix our corrupt political system, save America, and get to work on fixing everything else that's broken in our country. This is how we build this movement big enough to trigger that rush of state activity that leads to a change in federal law. And that brings us to our last line. Right now, this is you. And right now, these are all of the ways that you can help us go state by state, city by city, to fix the corruption in American politics. Volunteer and join a Represent Us chapter. Or, if that's not your thing, join the Commonwealth to make a monthly donation in support of someone who does volunteer. 100% of your money goes straight to passing these laws, not to overhead or our expenses. Every voice matters. Your voice matters. If you do nothing, nothing changes. But if we all do a little, we can win together. So the only question left is this. Will you cross that line? Join us at represent.us. Part of my success strategy is whenever I can let Jennifer talk for me, I let her do it. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so she just um, broke down what we refer to as issue zero. It's the issue that has to be solved to fix all of the other issues that are out there. You know, I don't know if, if you're like me, that line that she talked about is not how I was told in uh, U.S. government is supposed to work. You know, in civics class, that's not what they told me, that you had a 30% chance regardless of if you cared about it or if you didn't care about it. It still had a 30% chance of passing. What she didn't show, which uh, we use on one of our other slides, is that if you're in the top half of 1%, uh, if the top half of 1% wants a law passed, 78% of the time it's going to pass. So what does that say? It says that you know, laws are working for a very small group of people, not everyone. But she also showed our plan, our solution. And she gave some examples of why we believe our solution works. It's because historically it has, for issue after issue after issue after issue. And again, the point is not whether you support that issue or not. The, the point is that they've shown that that's how you can get a winning strategy. 850 um, laws pass, and then boom, we'll have the momentum that we need to get it to go at the national level. Currently, I think we're at about 93 um, cities have passed, including locally, um, city of Tempe and uh, city of Phoenix. So uh, really excited, uh, um, enthusiastic about that support. And yet, when we got those laws to pass at the city level, the state um, fought back. And so that's one of the reasons why Represent Us is such a huge supporter of Outlaw Dirty Money, which is a statewide initiative. And I'll let Terry talk more about that specifically, but I will say at this point in time that Represent Us is firmly behind Outlaw Dirty Money, and we want to make sure that that passes. Um, so I do want to uh, point out a few things. Uh, she showed she didn't talk about all of them, but she showed a lot of the different ways that we have that you can contribute to represent us. Uh, we would love to have more volunteers. If anybody wants to get involved, uh, we could definitely use that support. Uh, the Commonwealth is a good uh, monthly program that just automatically comes out of your bank account if you want to set up um, and support us that way. Um, we have phone banking. We have uh, um, uh, social media. Uh, help. Uh, there's lots and lots of different ways you can find out and you can help um, our organization at represent.us if you want to find out more information. Uh, we have an online chat tool that you can come on and you can talk to me. I'm there pretty much every day. So we have, we, we talked about the problem, we talked about the solution, and we talked about how you can get involved in making the solution happen. After that, uh, it's really just question and answers. Um, I'm going to let Terry talk more about uh, Outlaw Dirty Money, which is a huge component of the solution that we see here in the state of Arizona. And then after, uh, if you have any questions for Represent Us, I'd be more than happy to answer.
Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. And this is an exciting uh, group of people. And I, I agree that the enthusiasm in the room is palpable, even after that really depressing <laughs> discussion with Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> My favorite poet, many of you may know Josh Silver, the founder of Represent Us, who spent some time in Arizona bringing us something called Clean Elections, a, a very important citizen passed initiative in this state where we've actually taken a national uh, lead in an area where I think most people think Arizona is not so great, but that is in trying to make our elections better. Now it needs some work now, so Josh needs to come back and help to fix that, but uh, he's had a mark here in this state, not just the folks in yellow shirts in the back, but uh, previously with some of our very positive election moves. But I'm, I'm here to amplify the point that Jennifer Lawrence made and didn't you like the moment where she told Josh to shut up? I, I thought that was, that was really important. We have an example here in Arizona of exactly what Jennifer was talking about. And I call it dirty money. Many of you may know it as dark money. Uh, have you read the book? Has anybody read the book by Jane Mayer, which I've got here? Yeah, I see a few. I encourage you to go to Changing Hands and get it. It's a mere, oh, four or 500 pages but it really is the most important thing that's been written about how our government is really controlled. And it talks about the Koch brothers, but many, many others who have polled literally billions of dollars and have very secretly over the past almost 40 years moved their agenda into the mainstream of American politics. And what we have through that anonymous Dirty money, and I call it dirty advisedly. You may know it as dark, but dark is morally ambiguous. Dirty is not. Dirty says this is polluting our democracy. And I believe that's exactly what's happening. So here you have, yeah, thank you. I do. <laughs> now you probably, if you haven't already, and I think you have, seized on what it is we're talking about. It's those ads that you see so often going up to an election that are sponsored by a group you've probably never heard of, who has an ambiguous name, and I mentioned Americans for Peanut Butter, and we have a little peanut butter here. Uh, the other is, of course, the Koch's favorite uh, entity, which is the Americans for Prosperity. Who's against prosperity? It sounds really great until you scratch around and figure out what it is they really mean. They mean prosperity for them. Um, but we basically have an effort, a very sophisticated, very legal effort to hide the ball, to make sure that you and I as voters don't have the slightest idea who it is that's really trying to influence our vote. So I believe, and, and you know, I used to be your prosecutor here in the state of Arizona, and I spent a lot of time going after what we called money launderers. And usually these were criminals trying to hide the source of the money so that they could move it either across the border or into legitimate legal operations. That's money laundering. It takes illegal money and turns it into what appears at least to be legal money. Okay, the same techniques, and this is one of the things that really got me on this track, the exact same techniques that the money launderers, the drug cartels, are using to hide the ball are what the dirty money people are using to hide the ball from you. And you have to ask a question. What they're doing is not illegal. It's not selling drugs. What they're doing is trying to hide the ball so that voters won't know who's behind the proposition. Well, well why is that? And I've got a few ideas as to why that may happen. But let me, before I get to Barry, let me just uh, suggests that these are folks who don't want you to know who they are because you might vote against them if you knew who was really behind the ads. That, that's sort of number one. They may have customers or shareholders who may take it out against them either in the boardroom or in the marketplace. They may have regulated, I know this sounds incredible, but they may be regulators that would think that they were using actual regulated income 
to influence the vote. Now, I know that's preposterous, and I'll, I'll just leave that uh, out there for a minute. Now, a lot of people say that this is a democratic proposition. Some people think that I'm a Democrat, and they're right. Um, and I'm very committed to this. But there are also a lot of conservatives who feel that this is absolutely essential to save our democracy. And I just picked one out at random. Happens to be an Arizonan. The first quote is, is a, uh, and I was actually surprised to see that Barry was one of the spokesmen against unlimited spending. That's not what we're talking about here today. We're talking about transparency. But I thought it was important, because the two go together, that he has spoken out. And then he also really liked peanut butter. Uh, so he said, suggested that you could shave with it. Um, now, I said that I was going to lay this on the table for a minute. And let me just say for a minute what in, and, and I, I, I apologize in advance for, for even going here. But in law school, we sometimes use what we call hypotheticals. In other words, we pick an imaginary situation to illustrate a point. And sometimes they're very extreme. And, and so forgive me, this is so extreme that, that it, you may find it limit, it, it's, it's beyond credibility, right? But let's assume, just for a moment, to, to illustrate why I say that our democracy is in peril, that you have a popularly elected board called the Corporation Commission who sets electric utility rates. You with me so far? They're elected statewide. They have five members. OK, one of the major groups that they regulate is, let's hypothetically say, it has a, a, an acronym for its name, and it's APS. Just, just drawing out of the, the clear blue. And, and now the group that is regulated is trying to get a majority of the commissioners who set the electric lights to be their people. In other words, the ones that they endorse, support, and who will vote their way, right? Now, that's not possible, is it? In a, in a democracy, we would never allow somebody whose full allegiance was to the regulated company, the one that charges us for electricity, to actually be setting the rates. I, I told you this was outrageous. It was something that you probably couldn't possibly believe. And, you know, just to stretch it to the 2014 election, it actually happened. Using dark money, Arizona Public Service and Pinnacle West, which is the ownership entity, put an extraordinary amount of money into the election and elected through the primary and the general election their two hand-picked candidates. How could that happen? Well, here's how it happened. And we only recently found out, because disclosure is not a thing in Arizona. We lead the nation in hiding the ball. A little more about that in a minute. But basically, they spent $10.7 million. We now know because of two courageous commissioners who demanded to know where the money had been spent. Sandra Kennedy, who was recently elected, and who was one of the victims of this 2014 election when they put their hand-picked people in, and Bob Burns. Uh, who's been there for a while and who has constantly stood up and said that we need to know as citizens where the money has been spent. But $10.7 million was the answer to what does it take to put a special interest candidate onto the Corporation Commission. That's why uh, Ed Montini, who I'm sure you've read his column occasionally, called us the bat cave of American politics. But here's the, here's the bottom line. What was done in 2014, that extraordinary hypothetical, is still completely legal in the state of Arizona. In fact, having found out about that, what did the legislature do? Oh, they made it easier to hide the money. They basically said, if you're a 501c4 corporation, and that's the, the vehicle that the Cokes and others use as their preference, all you have to be is in good standing with the IRS. And if you are, you don't have to have a campaign committee. You don't have to have a chairman. You don't have to have an address. All you do is spend money to influence elections. That's the law in Arizona today. And I believe, in getting back to the Jennifer Lawrence mission, it's up to us to do something about it. Because the legislature clearly will not. Now, I touched on this a minute ago. Why do you hide? Why in the world would you? If it's perfectly legal, well, this is some of the reasons. Um, 
and, and the kiss of death part is particularly important, but let me go to the bottom point there, and that is the 501c4 entity. Um, it's, it's, the Arizona law says that you've got to be in, in standing with the IRS. Has anybody seen a good standing certificate from the Internal Revenue Service ever in your life? They don't exist. <laughs> Arizona Corporation Commission issues good standing certificates. So that's probably, since many legislators really don't go beyond, let's say, their own street in terms of research, um, they never figured out that there was no such thing at the federal level. So the way I interpret this is it means if you're not currently under indictment for tax fraud, <laughs> if you're a C4 corporation, that means a nonprofit but not, the, not a charity. It's the, their advocacy nonprofits. There are many good ones. Let me say that right up front. But when Citizens United was decided in tw 2010, all of a sudden, a whole lot of smart lawyers from big corporations started forming 501c4s because they figured that that was a way to hide who the contributors are. So what are the consequences? Well, you always know one of them. Your electric rates are going up. And, and the little secret that I didn't mention before was those two commissioners, along with a couple of others, voted to raise APS rates by 20, $95 million a year. $95 million a year. Pretty good investment for the company, don't you think? Put in 10.7 once, and then you get 95 every single year going forward. That's why they're at record profits at the moment. And the staff of the Corporation Commission recommended against the increase. But these guys were not on our payroll. They were on somebody else's, and they were not voting in the interest of the public. So what are the consequences? Um, I think the most important is one of responsibility. When you disconnect the person or the corporation that earns the money and has reputational risk in the community from the person or entity that spends the money, what happens? What we used to call, in legal terms, the person who heads that second entity, the one that's spending the money, we call them the designated felon. <laughs> They're the person who does anything for the cause and keeps it from going back toward the person that's really paying them. So they have no responsibility in this community. I believe very strongly if Arizona Public Service had had their name on the ads that attacks Commissioner Sandra Kennedy, they would never have run because they were vicious ads. They were very negative. They made her look like a criminal unfairly and unfactually. So if somebody with, with skin in the game, with risk, had had to put up that ad, I think they would have shown some responsibility. But they didn't. The people paying for the ads were Americans for peanut butter. They were, it was a group that you would never associate back with Arizona Public Service. And they could say and do anything, and they do. And one of the things that most of us who've been in politics to cry today is the negativism. The fact that there's so much he said, she said. There's, you, you believe at the end of a congressional campaign in particular that both sides are criminals and you don't want to vote at all. Now, there's some people who really want that to happen, so bear in mind that that's a, a desired result. But those negative ads are almost always the vehicle for dark money because the political cultists will say they work and the designated felon who's running the organization is going to do whatever it takes to win. So if it means lying, if it means attacking, if it means doing unfair things, they will do it. So unfortunately, that's the first loss. Uh, no reputational risk. So the loss of voter confidence, I think, is overwhelming. A, it demeans the system because it looks like everybody is corrupt because it's going back and forth. And this happens on both sides. Let me not say it's a right wing or a left thing. There are left wing uh, dark money operations as well. And I don't think that makes it right. I think bottom line, as citizens, we need to know who's paying for the ad. And if we don't know, how can you say we're knowledgeable voters? And I get this from college students especially all the time. They say, I have no idea who American prosperity is that's on the bottom of this ad. I have no idea whether I should agree with it or not because I can't evaluate the source. If you're a juror, the lawyers on both sides interrogate every single witness and they try to show what their biases are and what their what their accountability is, what their, what their uh, reputation is. But as voters, we don't get that chance. And I guess the bottom line of what I'm saying here is we should. Um, so what can we do about it? We're number one, I'm make that point again at the bottom, but we're number one in 
dark money spending, dirty money spending, and what can we do about it? Now I get to the, to the, to the sales pitch. I just dropped it on the floor. Here we go. <laughs> Next to our vote, this piece of paper is the most powerful thing we have as citizens. It's a petition. There are only about 20 states out of the 50 that have the constitutional authority to put a statute, or in this case a constitutional amendment, into law without going through the legislature. As citizens, we can do it ourselves. It takes an awful lot of signatures to do that, but it's a very important power that you and I have together. And so we can change the way it works in Arizona. You know, to pick up Jennifer Lawrence's repeated theme, you know, sometimes things get so bad that we have to get out of our chairs and do something to fix it. And I believe this is such a moment, and I believe this is, it's not a panacea, there are no panaceas out there, but this is one of the answers. And as somebody who's been in politics, I, I figured it out the other day, I've been in Arizona politics for almost 60 years now because I campaigned with my dad as a teenager. So I, I got seniority here, folks. I have never seen it this bad in terms of the political situation. I've never seen so much money involved. And as a former prosecutor, I always take the role, if you got a question, if you haven't figured out why things are going wrong or going in a particular direction, follow the money. That is the single most important thing. Everything else in politics, all of the good things that Jennifer Lawrence talked about, frankly cannot happen unless we fix the money side of the equation. And it has two parts. One, we need to know who's spending the money. And then second, after we've done that, and I think that's the most important first step, then I think we have to talk seriously about how much money. But that is step two. Step one, with, without step one, you never get to step two. And that's what this petition does. This basically changes the Arizona Constitution to say, and, and the most important part of it is right at the beginning. It gives the, every citizen the right to know the original source of all major contributions used to influence our vote. The right to know. Basically, that's what this is setting out to guarantee. Now, there's some details, and I got a few of them up here. Uh, there's a threshold. A major contribution is defined as $5,000. So we're not looking for everybody out there to disclose. Now, you probably know that you already, if you give $50 to a candidate, you have to disclose your name, your address, who you work for. That's the law in Arizona, has been for years. So this is not new, and, and we, don't, we don't go as far as the Arizona law does now. We just basically are looking for those major folks usually coming in at the end of an election trying to change the result. So an important part is the Citizens Clean Election Commission that I believe is the closest thing we have to a nonpartisan campaign on election or operation that, that, that oversees elections. They operate on the one particular area, the, the, the publicly funded candidates. But they have, I think, proven themselves to be both nonpartisan and able to make tough decisions. So we make them the person or the entity that enforces the rules and does the investigation. And I'd be happy to answer questions about any other parts of what this proposition do. But I want to deal with the opposition. Because you would hear, if you get involved with this, as I hope everyone here will, you're going to hear some people say, well, the Constitution, and specifically the Citizens United case, says that you have a constitutional right to hide. You have a privacy right to hide your contribution. Well, that is bogus. And I go right to the Citizens United decision. This is Justice Kennedy's words, not mine. And he says, we know, in essence, what he said, and I'm paraphrasing what's on the screen, but he said, we know that this decision that says that money is speech and corporations are people, as silly as that may sound, um, but that's what Citizens United did, is going to unleash an awful lot more money in politics. But the antidote is that citizens have the right to know and disclosure at least gives them the power to understand who's behind that cash. Now, unfortunately, about a year before he stepped down from the court, Justice Kennedy gave a very disturbing speech to the American Bar Association in which he said that was his opinion at the time he wrote it in 2010. He had since then learned how anemic the disclosure laws in the United States of America are, state and federal. So unfortunately, the justice that wrote these words, which I couldn't agree with more, transparency enables the electorate to make informed decisions and give proper weight to different speeches. And so if anybody ever uses Citizens United as a reason not to disclose, they are wrong. Now, here's a guy who I seldom quote. <laughs> but believe me, in this context, I have come to admire Justice Scalia 
a great deal because he believed first and foremost in the right to know. And these are his words, and I think they're pretty stirring, and I think they're worth thinking about and remembering because he says, he as a justice never wants to sit on a court that through their decisions makes campaigning anonymous. That's what dark money, dirty money does. And he says, that does not resemble the home of the brave. So if you need a stirring foes, that you can need to go no further. So has anybody seen the dark money movie? It's on, uh, I think it's on Amazon, no, Netflix. Um, it's, uh, it's a pretty powerful piece. It's about a state that's very much like Arizona, Montana. Very red state, very conservative state, very western state. A state, frankly, that has so many things in common with Arizona, it's a little breathtaking. And they have a divided government. They have a Democratic governor, Steve Bullock, and they have a very, very hard right Republican legislature. And in 2017, the two worked together, as I think should have happened here in the state of Arizona, and they legislatively passed a very powerful piece of transparency legislation. And they've stood up to the Koch brothers in three separate lawsuits and defended their statute and succeeded. And the person who did that was a guy named Tim Fox, who's a friend of mine. He's the attorney general of Montana, and he's a very conservative Republican. So this is not a partisan issue that we're talking about here. At least it wasn't in Montana. And uh, this is my new hero. Um, he looks like a lot of people I knew when I was campaigning with my dad in, in rural Arizona. <laughs> Um, see, he's wearing a Stetson. He's, I'm guessing, in his mid-70s. He's got a handlebar mustache. But here's the key. He's frowning at the camera. How many politicians have you ever seen that frown? This, this is the beauty shot for his legislative yearbook. There is not a smile in this man's soul. And you can't see that, but on his lapel is a word. There's only one word. It says coal. Senator Ankeny is no liberal. He comes from Coal Strip, Montana. But if somebody's going to shoot me in the gut, I want to see who done the shooting. And for me, that says what we're trying to do here. If somebody's going to shoot you, I want to know. But here's somebody a little closer to home. Um, and you probably heard of Senator McCain. Uh, and one of the things he said, and, and I think if he had still been around, I think he'd be one of our strong supporters. I hesitate to invoke people who aren't currently on this earth, but you know Lincoln has been known to support an awful lot of things uh, <laughs> long after his untimely demise. So, uh, but Senator Kane made be, 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 no, be, did not beat around the bush. He thought that, that money in politics, and especially secret money in politics, was part of the bane of our existence, and that that was something that he believed needed to be fixed. And so he stood up strongly in saying that's what we had to do. So only we can fix this mess. And let me, let me do a shout out here to the citizens of Tempe. Um, cities can start the ball rolling. And Tempe did, and the Vice Mayor Lauren Kuby is in the back, and I want to give her a big howl, hello. <laughs> can you stand up, Laura? Can you? This lady led the fight to make sure that Tempe saw the light and, and did the job, and they passed a charter amendment by 91%. Putin, 91.4, right? <laughs> Who's quibbling? Putin doesn't get numbers like that. <laughs> this is amazing. This, in a democracy, this is as, and it goes back to Jennifer Lawrence's point that you know, it doesn't matter how many people are in favor. I keep thinking, 91% of any group are in favor of your deal. It ought to be the law. That's unanimous in our democracy, um, but not quite. And then Phoenix did it, and, and the number that, that Carl used was 85%. I thought it was 87, but who's, who's worrying? It was another very large number in the city of Phoenix. And I believe that other cities, Flagstaff is talking about doing a similar proposition. Tucson, uh, their council unanimously endorsed transparency in, in political funding. Uh, th this is something people want except those people in the Arizona legislature and one or two in statewide elected office who are standing in the way. So once again, that gives us only the, the proposition that we're talking about, outlaw dirty money. Uh, we'll change that, it will change our constitution. I'm confident that if it gets on the ballot, 
The people of Arizona will do just what the citizens of Tempe did. And the <laughs> I'm throwing my notes on the floor. Um, and they will pass it. But getting on the ballot is a huge job. Uh, I think it says here on the bottom, we need 357,000 signatures of registered voters. That's more people than in this room. <laughs> and in fact, the only way we're going to get there is one signature at a time, one voter at a time. But you can help us a lot. Uh, Phil is here. Phil, could you stand? Uh, he has a whole lot of petitions that he was nice enough to bring here this morning. And as you leave, as public-minded, enthusiastic, dedicated members of our community, I wish you'd take at least one because it has 15 signs on it. And it's relatively easy if you carry it around with you to get those 15 filled out. And you don't even have to do all 15. It is not legally required that you fill out the entire petition. Because believe me, we are grateful for 5, 10, 12, whatever number works. We do need them back. Because there is a deadline. They have to be filed. And we also need to know where we stand. So there's a, a real virtue in constant turnover. And my job is to make sure that nobody ever asks for a petition and doesn't get one. So hopefully you will think, we want to have you sign, of course. But what I'd love to do is to have you be the first signature on our Nights Fresh petition that you go out now and get 14 of your fellow citizens to sign as well. So that's my message. It's a big, big step toward fixing the broken democracy that Jennifer Lawrence talked about so brilliantly. And she is certainly much better as a spokesperson than I am or Carl is or that Josh Silver is. But we can't always get her to the meetings, so we have to try to double up. Um, thank you very much for the chance to be here. If there's time, I'd love to answer questions. Thank you. OK, I will be passing around a microphone. If you wouldn't mind, please hold your questions until the microphone does get to you. And we will start right here. In Tempe, did they limit to $500 uh, contribution? Um, and doesn't it seem if we could get each city to do this, it would be a good start to help with this national movement? Um, I've tried to do it in Scottsdale, but I happened this morning to look through Mayor Lane's campaign contributions, and one company alone gave him 20000 for a $36,000 a year job. Whoa. Um, I'll let Carl talk about the 500, or, or maybe Vice Mayor Kuby could. Um, but let me, let me touch the other half. Yes, if cities take the initiative, people will hear the message. But there is a very appropriately named legislator from Southern Arizona. His name is Leach. <laughs> now, I, I, I hesitate to make fun of people for how they look or what their name sounds like. But frankly, his was you know, a birthright that is very appropriate. What he did as soon as Tempe passed the law was he passed a preemption statute in the state of Arizona that said cities and towns cannot regulate anything that has to do with contributions from any nonprofit corporation. And they passed it through the legislature. Now, I know that sounds amazing. I mean, I'm sorry. You want to tell 91% of the people of any community that they can't do what they want to do, I find that outrageous in our democracy. But once again, what we're talking about here today is outrageous stuff. And that's what right now is the law in the state of Arizona. Now, Tempe, I think, probably will challenge that law eventually because they will uh, find a violation and they will make some kind of sanction. And then we'll have a battle to the Arizona Supreme Court. That's not a happy thought. Because I've had some experience with the Arizona Supreme Court, and Governor Ducey has done a really great job of getting his friends to fill those positions. And so they don't like transparency. He does not. He's a very, very passionate fan of the Koch brothers. He appears at all of their summer rallies. And he's not hiding the ball. Uh, he's been very out front about saying he thinks that dirty money is perfectly appropriate. I disagree with him, so we have a a strong uh, dynamic here uh, in terms of this, this issue. But let me let Carl talk about the, 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 uh, the amounts of, because uh, Tempe did do different, different thresholds than are in this state law. But unless we pass a constitutional change, 
Tempe and Phoenix and other cities who try to do this are facing a very, very difficult and expensive legal battle. I think they may win, but they shouldn't have to go through the process. So we need to change the Constitution, which basically makes Representative Leach illegal, not Tempe. Are you with me? Since we do have the vice mayor here, I'll let her respond to the exact number. Um, however, I do want to point out a few things. One, yes, we, we're working city by city as a first step. So we are um, actively working right now on a, uh, a bill very similar for the city of Scottsdale. If you want to be part of that, we would love to have you actively involved. And 60 local uh, businesses have all signed for that. Uh, we're trying to get it through the same process that we worked with with the city of Tempe and with the city of Phoenix. Unfortunately, we had a lot of support with the city councils in those cities, and so far in Scottsdale, we, we haven't had that kind of support. Um, that said, uh, in Tucson, uh, there was the belief that Tucson was not going to pass, uh, and then when the vote came up, we had about 60 people show up in the yellow shirts, like you see some in the back half, uh, and suddenly their city council said unanimously, yeah, we'll pass that here in Tucson. <laughs> so uh, we believe that we do have the power to make those kinds of changes. We do, even if we're not able to pass it, at um, the city council level, we will continue to go ahead and do a ballot initiative for the city of Scottsdale. Uh, we do want to keep this momentum. You know, uh, thus far we're three for three. Three of the cities that we've um, that represent us has put our efforts in, in in the state of Arizona. We've won, so we seem to have this like feeling that we can't lose. Uh, so, uh, despite the fact that the state, like within a week. Um, put HB 2153 in place. Uh, we still realize that the citizens understand, and even though some of the legislators think that the citizens aren't smart enough to make their, the right decision, we believe that the citizens understand the need, and again, across the board, doesn't matter if you're left or right, uh, 91%, over 91% and you know, over 85% uh, clearly shows that regardless of what your political background, um, people get the reason why this is issue zero. So Tempe's law requires if you're a group or an individual that you spend over $1,000 Sure, sure. Tempe's law requires if you spend $1,000, if you're a group or an individual that spends that much, you have to disclose the original source of that. And the penalty is up to three times the amount of that if you violate that law. And we've had a limited success with the Attorney General when that was challenged under the Super Preemption Bill 1487, where any legislator can challenge any law of a city. And if they're deemed, if we're deemed to be violating the law, we have to give up all of our shared revenue. This is. A, the most chilling preemption law in the country, by the way. Um, we had limited success and, you know, somewhat success, and they said our law can proceed. But note that Kate Gallego is one of the strongest supporters of disclosure in the state and in the country, and Phoenix and Tempe intend to move forward when we have a violation that we perceive that we want to move forward with, so that's a good thing. On a separate initiative, Tempe voters voted to limit contributions to campaigns from $6,250, imagine that, to $500. And there's been, you know, for in adjustments for inflation. So now it's $520. That's the limit you can give to a campaign. But we also require, if you're a, camp if you're a candidate and you take money from a lobbyist, you have to check off on the form, this was a lobbyist contribution. And we have a system of checking. And so if you violate that, you'll be on notice, and that'll be a violation of our campaign disclosure. Because that was very important. Candidates were taking that money and they were putting in, you know, attorney <laughs> for the occupation, but not noting that they were actually a lobbyist. So that's been an important part of our campaign finance reform because there's all these different pegs. And we did the campaign contribution limits. People said, but there's outside money. It's like, yeah, we're getting to that. There's lobbyist money. Yes, we're including that. It's like important that once you, it's like whack-a-mole. Once you establish some law, there's another one that pops up and we're realizing it's integrated, it's, it's coordinated, we need to really be multifaceted in the laws that we put forward to, can to reform our campaign finances. Thank you. A, a quick, quick question, how many folks here are voters in the city of Phoenix? 
few? Okay, good. Me too. Uh, on Tuesday is an election. And the sole source of the election is two propositions, 105 and 106. And I've talked about the insidious influence of dark money, hopefully persuasively, but I at least talked about it. Both of those propositions are brought to us by dark money entities. Now, there, there are other entities involved. I want to make that clear. But the Koch brothers were heavily involved all across the country in trying to stop public transportation. And 105 would stop all light rail in the city of Phoenix if it's successful. The second one is a proposition involving the pensions, but it doesn't really talk about pensions. It's really talking about limiting all of the quality of life activities that the city does, because that's where, that's what would be cut under that Proposition 106. And that's brought to you by a group locally, also a dark money group, called the Free Enterprise Club. And so just think about the source. We know, we don't know where the money comes from, but we do know that the most recent supporter are dark money operations for 105 and 106. And I personally am voting no, and I urge you to do so as well. So I have a question regarding the initiative, or the ballot of signatures. Rumblings, the last time we went through this, rumblings were, if you write outside the box, we're throwing out your signature. And I never heard what the beginning, the end, or the middle was of that, so. Okay, this is your petition. This is your power play right here. And, and you'll notice it does have little boxes for your name and your address and so on. And you're absolutely right. Uh, a lot of people got concerned, legitimately concerned, that you had to now, having never had perfect penmanship in your entire life, <laughs> you have to exercise it. And I'm really worried for the entire medical community. <laughs> Because as we all know, if penmanship is a requirement, doctors are going to fail. <laughs> okay, the reason for that concern is again, have you gotten the idea that the Arizona legislature really does not like popular democracy? Is that, is that clear? Okay, that's fundamental. They have passed a series of laws, and, and we've just talked about one of them, trying to preempt the cities, that are successively harder and harder to do one of these. Now, if you're a candidate running and you need to get signatures to get on the ballot, there are, the last time we counted, 16 requirements that you don't have to do that people who want to get a law or a constitutional amendment do have to do. And the most recent was something that said that the laws will be strictly complied. Legislature didn't tell us what strictly complied means. And, and a lot of people interpreted that to mean that if you got outside the box, your signature would not count. I'm, I'm happy to say that, that, that there is no legal validity for that opinion. Um, so you can be a doctor and still sign the petition. If your signature goes way outside the box to the extent that it actually interferes with the next line, then if you're the petition passer, just skip a line. So what I advise people is be careful but not paranoid. In other words, there are strict responsibilities, and I would just like to mention two, since you got me in down here in the weeds. The first is up at the top, you have to check a box that says volunteer or paid. Now, unless there's something going on that I don't know about, please check the volunteer box, because <laughs> we don't have any paid, but the, the bottom line is that has to be done before you get any signatures. That's the law. The second one is it says county, and there are two places to put the county. There's no reason at all why you have to put the county down twice. <laughs> None, <laughs> except this. The Secretary of State will not count a signature that is not from the county His name is at the top of the petition. So if you're doing all Maricopa County and somebody from Pima shows up after you've made disparaging remarks about the U of A, <laughs> please have them sign a second petition. So if you have friends outside of this county and you're motivated to take a petition, take two. Because the out-of-county signature will not count. Now, I don't want to get in. You can't electronically. If you're a candidate, you can get people to electronically sign your petition. No, the legislature won't let us do that. So it has to be a hard copy. If you want to pull one down off our website, outlawdirtymoney.com, you can do that. You can get the language, but you can't circulate it. 
because they're very precise about exactly how big the margin should be and how well the interface between the front and the back should work. So even, even Carl, who is a tech wizard, I don't think could produce and download a legally circulatable petition. So you have to get from Phil or from me, you have to get a petition. There are a lot of requirements, but I hope that doesn't stop anybody because they've been done for exactly the tyranny that we're fighting against. The folks in the legislature who frankly don't want to hear us, the folks Jennifer Lawrence was talking about. And if we're going to change this situation, if this paradigm is going to shift, it's going to be because we're very careful, but we're very large, and we make sure that they hear us. No. Um, let, let, me, let me address that for a second. Uh, there is a rumor out there that if you sign twice, it invalidates the numbers. And that is the law in other states, but not in Arizona. If you sign twice, the second signature is not counted. And that's all. You don't go to jail. <laughs> you don't commit a misdemeanor. And what I advise people, and it, it is not easy because we had a similar petition in 2018. So some people, I hope many of you, signed that one. This has got, it says advisedly, Outlaw Dirty Money 2020, because you might get clear this is a new proposition. And if you sign the last one, you can sign this. But don't sign this one twice. If you remember, if you honestly can't remember, then sign it again. Uh, I'm sorry, I should not have put the again in there. <laughs> sign it for the first time a second time, is that, is that better? <laughs> if you can't remember, do it again, do it. But if you can remember, don't do it a second time. Is, is there a site where you can uh, pull up that film? The film, Carl, the film. The film by, uh, with uh, Jennifer Lawrence. Certainly, so you can go to represent.us and uh, on the first page, there's uh, a link that says uh, Unbreak America and you can get the video there. It's also available on uh, YouTube if you just search for Unbreak America. Oh, great. But let's see okay. if I can, if you go to represent.us. I told you he was a tech wizard. <laughs> <laughs> you see the very first thing we have here is the Jennifer Lawrence video. Or we can share it. You can share it, yes. Share it. Yes, and I encourage you, please, yeah. share it with everyone. Get it out there, yeah. Who has the mic? Yes. I, I do. Two things. First of all, um, I have a petition uh, that is, I, I have a petition that is uh, for a candidate uh, to get on the ballot. Uh, it happens to be someone we all know, but because it is a, a partisan petition, I will be standing out on the sidewalk after we're done here. <laughs> uh, secondly, um, Yes, I signed the petition. In fact, I circulated a lot of petitions the last time. Uh, what went wrong there, and has it been fixed? Thank you for that question. I, I, I uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm in recovery, but I actually am a lawyer, so <laughs> I can tend to go off on this, the answer to this question. I'll try to be brief. Essentially, we did a mixture last time. We had a volunteer, about half of our signatures from volunteers, and because we very seriously wanted to get on the ballot, a few people dug very deep, and we got some paid signatures as well, about half and half. Um, there's a rule in the state of Arizona, again, one of these uh, ones the legislature passed, which frankly are hostile to democracy, and they said, if you're a paid petition passer, you have to, you have to file with the Secretary of State a service of process address. That's what they called it. Well, many paid petition passers do not come from Arizona. They're itinerants. So our group had a fair number. You, you probably remember the solar initiative. Uh, those were all paid petitions. Well, some people, I, I get, it was not 100%, but it, they, they didn't take any chances at all. And Tom Steyer spent a gazillion dollars to get that one on the ballot. And he had over 1,100 paid passers. We had a much smaller number, but 
what the law says is if you are a paid passer and a subpoena is issued to that address that you gave the Secretary of State and you don't show up at the hearing, then all of your signatures are void. Now think about that for a minute as a constitutional right that you and I have in Arizona to petition our government. What that says is that in order to punish the person who didn't show up at a hearing, we're going to disqualify everybody who signed the petition that that man or woman was passing. I think that's unconstitutional. I, I, have, I have no bones about it. I think that's using fast and loose with our constitutional rights. The second part is the way they did it. And, and frankly, they served 14 uh, subpoenas on the aid petition passers at the address that they gave, which was an office building on Central Avenue in Phoenix. Okay, I was personally watching that office because I knew about this law and we wanted to make sure that they didn't try to sneak one in. So the office was vacant, nobody was there. And so I assumed that there was no way that they could use that office to pass, to, to, to do the subpoena. Well, I was wrong because what they did was they came in on the weekend and they dropped 14 subpoenas on the security guard in the building. That security guard had no authority to accept and he did not pass them on to us or anybody else. They just went into probably the garbage can. So the first we heard about those subpoenas was in the hearing when those witnesses were called. Well, by then it was too late because when you have election challenges, they come very fast because they have to get them wrapped up so that they can print the ballots. And that's as it should be. So we had no chance to say, Your Honor, we'd like to have a continuance because we need to go and see who passed this petition and what authority the guard had to receive them. So we didn't have that chance to do. And the court said, okay, they didn't show up. We're going to strike 10,000 signatures. And we were fairly close to the legal max minimum. And so that was enough to put us below. And then the Supreme Court, before the election, or before the, the time was up, two days later, validated that decision. I think it was very bad law. I've read the opinion very carefully. There were several things that Justice Lopez, frankly, did not understand about the record. He, for instance, didn't know that we had no idea that these petition, these signatures had ever been, I, the, the, I'm sorry, that the subpoena had ever been tried to serve. But, and he incorrectly put that in his opinion. So, bad job. I believe unconstitutional, but we don't have in this system of laws, there's no other way to go around that. So our only option was to go back and try again. And that's what we're here today. So thank you for the question. I'm sorry about the answer, but that's what happened. But one of the things that we are doing different this time is we're trying to go 100% with volunteers. Yeah. So that changes that, that dynamic. That's absolutely right. I'm sorry. That was the critical second part. <laughs> we, we started back in April and have been, and, and the, the petitions are due on July 2nd, 2020. So I'm not saying it's plenty of time. It is nothing is plenty of time when you have to get 357,000 signatures. But it does give us more time so that volunteers can get horsed up, talk to their friends and family, hopefully take this to Thanksgiving dinner, and get us a lot of signatures that way. So volunteers don't have the same obligations that paid petition passers do under Arizona law. And Councilwoman Kuby has a. Four weeks from today, on September 22nd, 4 p.m., we are hosting a fundraiser in support of Outlaw Dirty Money. And this is Mayor Kate Gallego, the Honorable Corey Woods, who's running for mayor, and um, Congressman Greg Stanton, and of course, the lovely Terry Goddard, and myself. And it's at Cortiere, which is at Mill and Alameda. And it's also a place for you to bring petitions back. We'll have a notary there. It's a place to collect more petitions. We really want this to be a celebration. And Tempe, with our 91.44%, I want all of those voters there to support Outlaw Dirty Money because it takes money to have a staff. You have a professional staff that is organizing on the ground. It costs money to print up the petitions. We need to support them in every possible way we can. So please write on your calendar. And if there's a way I can get this information out to the group, it'd be really appreciated. But September 22nd, 4 p.m., Cortiere at Millen Alameda. Let's 
come out and show a good Tempe and East Valley welcome for Outlaw Dirty Money. Fantastic. And just as a reminder, this is available to you on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel and you can get that information there. We can also put up links uh, in information uh, on in, in information on this uh, meetup. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I've got a different sort of a question here. Uh, since we can't follow the money a lot of times, you don't know if it's a Koch brothers or George Soros or Adolf Hitler or whoever it is, can we follow, somehow get the names of the people who are against these initiatives in politics? You, you keep talking about the legislature. Who are these people? Why, why are they voting against us? And how do we know, as a voter, I often look at my ballot and there's nothing on there that indicates if this person in the legislature ever voted my way or somebody else's way, I don't know them. I don't know anything about them. So if we could even get a list of, of potential people who like this, you know, who are running, that would, that would go a long way to helping us, the voters, vote in the right people. When HB 2153 passed, I swore everybody who voted positive for that was going to be known by all 16,000 of my members. Um, and so, in retrospect, it wasn't the most mature response. <laughs> but <laughs> But um, Representatives uh, did make sure that that, that was clearly said. And um, so we're talking, because urgency, we need to get the signatures. Uh, Representatives is very much about legislation. Uh, another aspect of Representatives is about overwatch. It's about accountability. It's about making sure, uh, so we have different components to represent us. Uh, in educating people about the issues, about what's going on, about making sure that there's um, citizen overwatch over the legislators, and about changing laws. Uh, so those are some of the three major components. But uh, Terry can talk about the legal aspect of that and the you know official response to that. But if you if you're part of Represent Us, you will know. Well, let's just go go past the partisan. Uh, you know, Republican, Democrat, you don't have any independents. Jennifer Lawrence made that point. Uh, that's something I think has to change in Arizona because they're now the largest party and they have no representation in the legislature, zero. Um, but the accountability is so important. And let me just get it back to all of us as voters. It is amazing to me as somebody who has stood for office a number of times, how unassertive most voters are. And now the press is pretty much missing in action. So you don't have the prototypical nasty reporter really zeroing in on a particular question because now the press seems to be on one side or the other. They're, they're either building somebody up or they're tearing somebody down, but that's opinion, not fact. So unfortunately, just like the petition, it comes back to us. When you're at a forum, actually ask questions about things like this. I mean, excuse me, this is not a cakewalk. It should not be a beauty contest. Candidates for office need to come before the public and answer questions. Now, actually, that's becoming a little bit rare. Uh, I've seen a number of congressmen on this last recess that did no, do, did no forums, did no town halls. Hold, please remember that. Um, but there are a couple other things. So after we got thrown off the ballot in the last, the 2018 election, we formed our Outlaw Dirty Money Posse, and it goes right to your question, because we then went to every candidate, Republican and Democrat, for the legislature, and said, how do you stand on both promoting legislation that would require full transparency, or trying to block any future legislation that reduced transparency? Those were the two questions. And we got a lot of Democrats and a surprising, you know, considering some of the positions of current elected officials, we got a lot of Republicans. 
that signed on and said, yeah, we think that's simply good for government. We think that's important. And so we asked for those commitments. And it was on our website, outlawdirtymoney.com. Uh, it's not there right now because you know, legislators are not currently running. But when they do, we will do it again. So there are ways to find out where people stand. But Carl's got a pretty good one. If they voted for that statute, I hope that you'll remember because they voted against you. And especially if you live in Tempe, they specifically voted against you. I, I also want to uh, point out, uh, being a little bit proactive about that, uh, similar to what uh, Terry just said uh, ODM did, um, represent us, ask um, anyone running for office. We send out a questionnaire to see if there will be support of the American Anti-Corruption Act. And if they're only in support of certain aspects of the American Anti-Corruption Act, which ones they are. And then we give a report card, and that's available on our website. Um, currently, everyone running, um, I don't remember if, they, if they've had their election or not, but uh, for Tucson, everyone who's running for the mayor of Tucson actually uh, endorsed the American Anti-Corruption Act, which was, this is the first time we had everyone who was on the board in the state of Arizona, at least, uh, was in favor of the American Anti-Corruption Act and endorsed it. So uh, that's one of the ways that we help to try to educate people about, about uh, candidate stances. So ask tough questions and look at the, do your research. I, that's the answer. So Terry, it's funny you bring up the media and the press. I work in the media and the press, so <laughs> <laughs> we get it, fake news, I'm all about it. I totally understand it. So um, I want to talk about accountability real quick because this is all neat and cool and stuff. But I went through a process with Kate Gallego. There was a Phoenix Suns arena renovation process that just finished that was terrible, gnarly, and nasty, and nobody knew the facts. I work in talk radio. Kate Gallego goes on 92.3 KTAR and said half a dozen things that were just patently false, which I was thankful I tuned in because it got me doing research and Kate Gallego, who, as we've heard this morning, is 100% anti-dark money. Who wants to guess how she got elected? Kate Gallego took a pile of dark money. Let's talk about accountability. We have, we have guys like, we know Moscow Mitch and Donald Trump, and by the way, I'm just curious, how many election fraud prosecutions has anybody in this room ever heard of or ever seen? How many times have we said, oh, well, you have to do this because this is the new law? Where are the prosecutions? And if you want to talk about accountability, I've asked Kate Gallego to come on my talk radio show. Voted number one in Phoenix, my talk radio show. Over a dozen times. Not one phone call return. Not an email return. Her press secretary, so the Suns did a bunch of community meetings on this renovation, right? Oh, she'll be there tonight, you guys can talk. Six times, no showed. Never talked, never answered. Never, not one time. So you're an elected official, multiple times. You've done, you, you have, you've been a great public service. I know all about your record. I would ask you. That scares me. It, it's, <laughs> well, again, fake news, which is fine. But my point is, there's no accountability. And I think in this room, if you want accountability, you better know the ballot initiatives. You better understand why light rail matters to you or it doesn't. You better understand why people in Tucson are backing things, but then not. How many people really say I'm against dark money, but then don't want to release their donor list? So I would ask, as an elected official in, in the past and, and whatnot, I would ask you, how do we get real accountability with our elected officials? Good question. Um, and, and you were very circumspect not to promote your show, but I think I now know exactly what it is. Um, and as Kate's chairman, I, I, I feel a little defensive here because I think she has generally been pretty open and she was opposed to the Sun's bailout. So I don't understand why she wouldn't have come and spoken with you. So I'll, I'll do what I can to intervene there. Really? Okay. Well, I, my, my, uh, my thought here is, you know, any politician ought to be actually courting people who are asking critical questions because that's frankly how we get to know and if you just talk and this is a 
almost a national malady right now. We, we've divided ourselves through social media into tribal enclaves, and we talk less and less, excuse me, I'm gonna get way up on the platform and I'll come back to your question. We talk less and less to people that we disagree with. And I think that tribalism is really hurting our democracy. That's a whole different issue. I, this summer I listened to a speech by a, a dean of a major law school who said that she thought it should be required, especially for students, to have time spent with folks they disagreed with. Because right now, even in the academic community, they're not doing it. So I, I think that goes doubly for the press. And I forgive me for attacking your tribe, your group, but frankly, the press, I, when I was mayor of Phoenix, the Republic had two reporters in City Hall and the Gazette. Remember the Gazette? Yeah. Anybody remember the Gazette? They had two reporters in City Hall. Today, they have no reporters in City Hall, period, and they barely cover City Hall. So a lot of the things you're talking about in terms of city issues, at least in Phoenix, are not covered in the major newspaper. That's wrong. You know, major things happen, and we never hear about them. There was a little incident. Let me just share it with you for a second. I was 8 o'clock at night. I was with my staff. We were talking about a variety of agenda issues that were coming up. It was very much a strategy session. And my press secretary raised her hand, put her finger to her lips, walked to the door, the big uh, ornamental doors, and she pulled it open. And the Republic reporter literally fell into the room. <laughs> and at the time, I was furious. I was really angry. But I use that now as an example of the press doing their job because he belonged there. There was nothing illegal about where he was. Frankly, it was not an open meeting, so I guess technically having it open to the press, but damn it, what Art Thomason did at that moment, I just outed him, and he's still, <laughs> he's still with the press, he's a senior level somewhere, was exactly what a vigilant press, that's what we depend on as citizens, that the, somebody is listening at that door. But I gotta say that that has, doesn't happen anymore. There's very few opportunities where the actual investigative report meets the political process. So that comes back to us. You know, as citizens, we need to ask those questions at forums. Don't just sit there like sheep and, and, and agree that what they said was always right. Uh, it isn't always right. Critical questions are, the, the, I think, the, one of the hallmarks of our democracy. How do you hold public officials accountable? Again, it's back to the voters. Uh, if you have the option of voting them out of office, and it seems to me that if somebody has, if they come back to the, if they're congressmen and they come back to the district, they refuse to do town halls, and there are a number I know that have done, you know, in the last cycle have not done that. Frankly, that ought to be a black mark uh, the next time they're up for election. And I hope you will remember. I hope you will count those. Uh, they will be more responsive to reporter phone calls in the future if, in fact, they know their consequences. But if they know that there's none, frankly, they're not going to return your phone call. I just want to add that, you know, as a grassroots organization, our position at Represent Us is that the accountability happens through us. You know, that's the reason why our name is Represent Us. You know, it's a, it's a challenge. It's also a dare that if you don't represent us, there's going to be consequences. And so, uh, not just us, uh, every year we host um, uh, a huge convention, Terry's been to both of them so far, uh, called uh, UNRIG, uh, where uh, lots of different grassroots organizations come together. If, if for whatever reason, Represent Us doesn't like completely jive with you, there's lots of other uh, grassroots organizations that you can support, please do so. Uh, right now, I'm biased of course, but right now I believe that that's the primary way you're gonna get the information that you need to know and the primary way that uh, accountability is held currently. Now, it shouldn't be that way. Our courts should hold these people accountable. Our press should hold these people accountable. There's, there's lots and lots of different places where historically, or at least according to the myth, uh, they should be held accountable. But ultimately, it always comes back down to the citizens. And we have to remind them of that. And that's what representatives is here to do. So technically speaking, we've run over our own time. Uh, to our speakers, is, would it be okay for two more questions? Yes? Okay. It's okay with you. Okay. Uh, Terry, a uh, quick uh, question, two-part question. 
does the would the initiative apply to uh, federal candidate, candidates for the U.S. Congress and have any of our representatives to U.S. Congress taken a position of, in favor of your initiative? Thank you. Um, no, it doesn't. Uh, a state initiative can't affect federal elections. And Congress, Senate, presidential are all federal. So what this affects are local, even school board, city council, uh, legislative, and statewide. So those, those, those are where this has direct implication. Now, I, I think, uh, again, back to Jennifer Lawrence's point, what happens at the state has amazing consequences up the line. And if Arizona, the state that has more dark money per capita per campaign than any other in the country as a percentage of political spending, can throw it out, that will be loud. That will be heard. That will be something that folks around the country will hear. Now, I'm going to leave some out, but Ann Kirkpatrick has been a supporter when we did this the first time. And this is the third time I've tried this. So, you know, I have some of my memory is historical. Ann called up and said, I think that's the single most important thing we can do for American politics. Count me in. Uh, Tom O'Halloran has been overwhelmingly supportive in his career. Ruben Gallego has been very supportive. Raul Grijalva has been very supportive. Um, and I'm probably leaving out a couple. Um, they are all Democrats. Uh, I have put the request to everyone, regardless of party, here's what we're doing. We need your endorsement. So far, we have one Republican legislator, Noel Campbell from District 1, a real stand-up guy, a great admiration for him. Uh, very conservative Republican, but he believes, like the guy I showed you on the, on the slide uh, from Montana, that if somebody's going to shoot me in the gut, I want to know who done the shooting. And I think Noel could have said that. And the other one is Bob Burns, a corporation commissioner, statewide elected official. Uh, he's not federal, but he has come out and supported us. So I'm happy to give credit to anybody from any party if they will jump on board. Um, and that's, uh, but the, the, you asked about the Congress people specifically. Um, and that's, that's basically where they, where, where they have come down. And I, I hope many of you could, whenever you talk to a congressperson or a legislative uh, individual, ask them how they stand on this because uh, you, you need to know. We all need to know. Okay, I think I have the last question. I'm over here. Um, now, I'm not sure if this is something that you're also focused on, but there have been a lot of television ads against um, Medicare for All. And um, there's, there's one that really gets me, and, and I'm sure that there's dark money behind this, and it's where, oh, we've got to get to the hospital right away. You know, this woman's going to code and blah, 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 and they get there and there's nobody there. Um, and they're going to, you know, we're all going to do, we're all doomed if we have Medicare for All. Or, or, and it's the, the supported by a group called, um, I don't know, doctors who don't want to, <laughs> be out of work or something. I can't remember <laughs> the actual name of the group. But no, I mean, it's not a good a name because it actually tells you where they stand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you're supposed to call call um, Senator McSally right away and tell her not to vote for something or other. Can you explain what what's going on? And is this in any way related to dark money? Well, yes, it is. And and you've touched on a really thorny issue that the Supreme Court has. May I say very respectfully, uh, made a hash of. Um, it goes back to a 100-page decision uh, called R Wisconsin Right to Life v. Uh, I forget who the who the defendant was, but it may be the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission. But they've tried to make a distinction between overt electioneering, where disclosure was appropriate, and education where it is not. And the ads you're talking about are specifically in the education side. Call Senator so-and-so and tell him to shape up. That's considered to be non-political. <laughs> now, your response tells me a lot about the Supreme Court's decision. It's like Justice Kennedy saying, well, the antidote is full disclosure, and then discovering that there ain't no free dis full disclosure. They used to say uh, many years ago that the Supreme Court read the papers. I sincerely doubt it uh, these days. But bottom line, what 
outlaw dirty money would do, and we, we tracked the Supreme Court decisions very carefully. We tried not to invade the education space. We only, and, and we tracked, we use language that's right out of this, and you'll see when you read the, hopefully you'll read the proposition. The only way you're supposed to disclose is if your advertisement specifically advocates the election or defeat of a particular candidate or proposition. That's tracking Supreme Court language. So if it doesn't do that, this doesn't cover it. But frankly, if we'd gone any further than that, Goldwater Institute or somebody would have taken us to court and it would have been found unconstitutional. So we tried to make sure we walked that line. However, there is an exception period. And if you're within 60 days of a primary election up until the general election, and you mention, you just name somebody who is on the ballot, you don't have to say anything else. It is assumed that you're trying to influence a vote and that will automatically trigger disclosure. So we tried to stretch it to the maximum we could under the current constitutional guidelines. But if you're close to the election and you name somebody, it is political. If it's not close to the election and you don't advocate their election or defeat, then it's considered educational. And I can't do anything about that. Right now, that is what the Supreme Court has said. And that's the law of the land. And to try to take it on in the form of this initiative, I think would be irresponsible, because then we could go to all this work and then get thrown out in court. And I don't want to have people go through that. So hopefully that answers your question with far too much detail. Let, let me just wrap it up, and then Carl have a chance. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you as involved citizens, as committed humanists, as people who care about our community, uh, listening to an hour and a half of our diatribes uh, about this particular issue. And, and I, I hope it's rewarding in that I believe passionately that this is the issue that will make or break our democracy. If we can't get serious right now about where the money comes from and who's spending it and why, I really despair about our system of government continuing uh, much longer because I hear from young people every day, I don't believe that my vote counts. And when I know what I know about where the money comes from and how big an influence, and when you see Jennifer Lawrence's pitch about the 30%, it's hard to argue against somebody who says my vote has no impact. So let's change that. And the first way I think we can change it is by getting this petition signed and getting this proposition on the ballot. So any help you can give us on that, gratefully appreciate it. Carl? I'm just going to do a quick um, add-on to that, and that is I'm often asked why I volunteer my time to do stuff like this. And the reason why is the people in this room. Um, the fact that you guys gather together to hear this uh, and you're so actively involved and interested, this encourages me. This gives me hope that there's actual possibility that we can fix the, the problems in our election. I truly believe that, and the reason why I believe that is because I keep coming up and standing in front of groups like this to talk about things like this and finding out that you know there's 91% support or over 91% support or 85% support. Um, and so that's very encouraging. I really appreciate you coming out today. Uh, please uh, sign up, uh, get more information, or go to our website, represent.us. Uh, we have a monthly meeting. We have online uh, tools. Uh, but uh, even if you don't go through Represent Us, just stay active. Keep your representatives accountable. Make sure that they understand that they're put in office to represent you. Period. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah, both of you. Great. If not, I mean, people are going to be running in a hurry. We've got lots of information here. Yeah. And um, I want to, we always mug our speakers when they're done. So <laughs> thank you for coming out. and. I hope we are in touch again soon. Excellent. With good news. Oh, a mug. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.